So, uh, we are, welcome back. So we are happy to have now Sebastian Schreiber, who is going to talk about co-evolution of habitat choice in a stochastic world. Thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm hopefully there in spirit. Uh, unfortunately, I have over a thousand intro bio students waiting for me to give them a lecture shortly after giving this talk. Mm -hmm. so I've been enjoying the conference in the evenings, watching the videos while unwinding from a lot of uh, demanding teaching uh, obligations. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, co-evolution uh, co of habitat choice in a uh, stochastic world. And um, this is joint work with Alex Henning at Texas A&M and Dan Nguyen at uh, University of Alabama. And the core question is what determines the distribution and abundance of plants and animals? For instance, what's determining the distribution and abundance of these smoky mountain thrushes along an elevational gradient in North America? And an answer, a key ingredient to answering this question was given by someone who wrote the following statement. I was studying earthworm brains for my doctoral dissertation. I was irritated by David Lack's dogmatic position that territorial behavior of birds did not affect habitat selection. In desperation, I put it all into mathematical models and made several wondrous discoveries. I soon dropped the earthworm research. Both the worms and I were having nervous breakdowns and getting nowhere. So this quote comes as a reflection from uh, Stephen Fretwell writing about his citation classic that introduced the concept of an ideal free distribution. So what is an ideal free distribution? So if we imagine we have a population that is living in distinct habitat patches, for instance, maybe butterflies and distinct meadows, they would be exhibiting a ideal free distribution if the per capita growth rate of the butterflies were equal in all the occupied patches and would become lower if they went elsewhere. Uh, this sort of description of the ideal free distribution makes it intuitively sound like an evolutionary stable strategy. In other words, a strategy if some individual instead try to occupy a different patch, they'll be lowering their growth rate and therefore be disadvantaged. Now, amazingly, this fact that it's an evolutionary stable strategy was not proven until the beginning of this century. And it has several important implications. First is under equilibrium conditions, at least, you will not have sink populations when you have an ideal free distribution. Uh, sink populations being populations where the per capita birth rate is ex uh, exceeded by the per capita death rate. If the main source of spatial heterogeneity is resource availability, for instance, in this uh, cartoon of stickleback in a tank, we have two patches, the left-hand side of the tank that's receiving five times as much resource as the, uh, the right-hand side of the tank. And under the ideal free distribution, the fish will redistribute such that every fish is receiving on average the same amount of resource. So you'll get a five to one ratio of fish in this cartoon, which was indeed what was observed by Malensky and his stickleback experiments in the late seventies. Now, ideal free distributions also have implications for co uh, interacting species. Um, for instance, if we had two competing species, these two warbler species along an elevational gradient, and they in the past had this hypothetical distribution where it overlapped, the ideal free distribution would predict that the species would spatially segregate, which is indeed what their actual distributions are, so that they're no longer competing with one another. Each species will preferentially use the habitat in which they're competitively superior. And because they're no longer competing, this is known as the ghost, ghost of competition past because it was the presence of competition that led to the selection of spatial segregation. Now, while these patterns are consistent with ideal free distribution, there are many examples of things that are inconsistent with an ideal free distribution. Sink populations are common across a diversity of taxonomic groups. Uh, there's often input mismatch observed in single populations and co-occurring competitors, as we saw in the first slide, are quite common. Now there's been some theoretical progress on this question, mostly for single species models that suggest temporal variation in environmental conditions can select for sink populations and input mismatch. But what happens when you have interacting species? Um, does you still have the ghost of competition past or not? That's the question I'm gonna be addressing here, which is what effect does spatial and temporal variation have on the coevolution of patch selection where I'm thinking of patches as distinct habitats and meta communities, in other words, spatially distributed communities. 
So to tackle this question, I'm gonna, or to discuss rather how I tackle this question, I'm gonna first introduce the models, talk about what coexistence means for a collection of species in these models, and then focus on the main results for the study, which is char um, characterizing co-evolutionary stable uh, uh, stability of uh, patch selection strategies, and then show some applications to antagonistic interactions, mutually in antagonistic interactions of competition, and then one-sided antagonistic interactions of predator-prey. And then I'll finish off by discussing how these results relate to the economic modern por portfolio theory and highlight the key results that I've discussed. So let me begin by discussing the models. For these models, I'm gonna to adhere to the KISS principle. In other words, keep it simple, stupid, because when it comes to the complexity of nature, Sebastian is inherently stupid. So what ways am I gonna keep it simple? I'm sure these are gonna offend probably at least one, uh, everyone in this audience for different reasons. First, uh, for those that love reaction diffusion equations, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be talking about implicit, not explicit space. For those of you that love type two functional responses, Hill functions and Ali effects, sorry, I'm just doing mass action lock Volterra dynamics. And for those of you who like levy noise, my apologies, I'm gonna talk about Brownian motions to describe the environmental fluctuations. Okay, so what does the model uh, appear? How does the model appear under these simplifying assumptions? I'm gonna assume they're K distinct patches. In this case, I'm showing you eight patches and that they're N species. In this case, I'm showing two warbler species. And to describe the dynamics, I'll first describe the dynamics within one patch and then discuss how I implicitly couple the patches across space. So within a given patch, it's gonna be lock of Volterra style dynamics. So each species will have its intrinsic per capita growth rate. Here always subscripts will denote species indices and superscripts will denote patch locations. And then in addition to the intrinsic rates of growth, there will be the effects of interactions on the species. So we'll have these interaction coefficients. Then we'll be keeping track of the density of each species in a patch. And so at first, the dynamics are just being given by the Locke Volterra equations, but then to make count for the environmental stochasticity. Oh, sorry. And I should emphasize here that the per capita growth rate of species I in patch L will always be denoted F with those uh, subscripts and superscripts. So that's one of the few pieces of nomenclature you'll have to remember that F is a per capita growth rate or the average per capita growth rate. We'll have these uh, Brownian motions uh, for each species in each patch uh, that will be acting in a multiplicative way on density to model environmental fluctuations. So this gives us a system of N stochastic differential equations. And now how do I couple them across space? Well, I have a model like this for each location in uh, space but now I assume that the distribution across space for each species is fixed. So there's a fixed proportion of species I in patch L, and there's some regional density of species I, which then under that assumption makes it that the density of species I in patch L is just the product of those two numbers, the proportion in patch L times the regional density. So this will lead to sort of taking just the spatial average weighted by the proportion in a given patch of the per capita growth rates. And then we'll also have still the Brownian uh, motions corresponding to the environmental fluctuations. And the key thing that we need for these Brownian motions for the results is understanding their spatial covariances. So each species will have a covariance matrix associated with their multivariate Brownian motion. Okay, so this is determining the model that we'll be working on with, um, it's still N, dimensional stochastic differential equation. If I flush things out, which is just for showing you what it looks like fully flushed out, it's easy to see this is just an overdressed lock of Volterra stochastic differential equation. And fortunately, due to a variety of efforts, you're able to characterize coexistence in a way that I'll describe in a moment, what coexistence means, using what I call the Hofbauer condition, which is using the Lyapunov exponents of the system uh, to determine whether the species coexist or not. Nice thing about this condition is it reduces to solving systems of linear equations and linear programming problems for the lock of Volterra type models. So fortunately it means that's very tractable sometimes by hand and certainly computationally straightforward. Um, but what do I mean by coexistence? Coexistence here is just meaning that I have a probability measure. It'll be a unique probability measure 
that's fully uh, support is uh, supported by the positive orthant and it's invariant. And moreover, the empirical measures converge almost surely to that uh, probability measure. So here's just a numerical illustration of convert empirical convergence to this stationary distribution uh, when you have coexistence of two competing species. Now, one thing that's nice is the coexistence criteria ensure that if your sort of test function is just the density of one of the species, that that's an L1 function with respect to this probability measure. So that means the mean species densities when they're coexisting are well-defined. And it's easy to show that those mean species densities satisfy a system of linear equations. So once again, you can solve for the mean values of the species densities at the stationary distribution just by solving a system of linear equations. Okay, so that's the model and just what I mean by coexistence. Now I wanna talk about what is coevolutionary stability here. So first I wanna discuss what do I mean by an evolutionary or coevolutionary stable strategy? It's sort of as this cartoon suggests, you have a resident community represented here by Batman, okay? And this resident community, you have the species coexisting and they're playing, each species is playing its patch selection strategy. So there's a collection of strategies, one for each species. And then you have a mutant arriving that plays a different strategy and for it to be a coevolutionary stable strategy for the residents, it should be the mutant strategy fails. Let's say, see what that means more specifically. So we have a resident community and each species in that community is playing a patch allocation stretch, uh, strategy or patch selection strategy. So each of those Ps are a vector. So you get an M by K matrix for the uh, resident strategies. Then you also are assuming we have coexistence. So in particular, the mean densities of the species are well-defined. And now you envision that for one of the species, I tilde, there's a mutant subpopulation that arises playing a different patch selection strategy from species I tilde. Uh, and that mutant population has density Y. And you take the resident dynamics and augment them with the dynamics of the mutants. So you're increasing the dimensionality of the system by one. And then assuming the mutant is first infinitesimally small in the system, you can compute what we call an invasion rate, which is a Lyapunov exponent. And this is the invasion rate of a mutant of uh, species I tilde playing the strategy Q against the resident playing the strategy P. And the details of the expression don't matter right now, but it's, you can write it out explicitly. And again, the X hats can be solved explicitly as solutions of linear equations. So it allows things to be fairly tractable. Now, what does this sort of infinitesimal rate of growth tell you? It tells you if it's negative for the full nonlinear system, if you start with low densities of the uh, mutants and you have the uh, N species, the resident species present, then with high probability that mutant will go extinct. In fact, will go at an exponential rate extinct determined by the invasion rate. And there are many instances where we could even show that for any initial condition, you go with probability one exponentially fast to losing that mutant. So given this invasion rate sort of determines whether success can occur or not, we're gonna define a coevolutionary stable strategy for the resident species as a collection of strategies in this matrix P such that any mutant playing a different strategy of any species will have a negative invasion rate, which means then it's unable to invade. So that gives us at least a sort of way to define a uh, coevolutionary stable strategy that ends up being just an algebraic condition, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to identify those coevolutionary stable strategies. So we wanna find at least a necessary condition that's easier to check. And the easiest way to get a necessary condition is just to use Lagrange multipliers here in the right way. So if we use Lagrange multipliers in the right way, uh, we can characterize the coESS. And I'm gonna describe the characterization in terms of a few key quantities. Uh, the first set of quantities deal with the mean growth rates. So we'll have um, here all the way on the right, the mean per capita growth rate of species I in patch L. Then when we take that weighted combination across the patches for species I, we get its regional mean per capita growth rate. So that's a pair of quantities that we need. The other pair of quantities is given by looking at the Brownian motion within, an, within a patch that's determining the environmental stochasticity within that patch. And then looking at the weighted average of the Brownian motions across the patches. So this is in some sense, 
the um, average Brownian motion experienced by species I, and then asking what's the covariance between those two uh, uh, pro, uh, time series. So you can calculate the covariance and that ends up giving us the third quantity, the covariance for species I between the fluctuations in patch L and the average fluctuations, spatially average fluctuations. And then if you take the weighted combination of those covariances, that gives you the regional variance experienced by species I. These four terms, uh, the two terms associated with the mean growth rates and the two terms associated with the variances can be used to give a necessary condition for being at the co-evolutionary stable strategy. So what the necessary condition is, is that in the occupied patches, say for species I, the difference between the contribution of patch I, uh, L rather to the per cap, mean per capita growth rate and the contribution of patch L to the variance experienced by patch uh, species I, that difference has to be equal across all the occupied patches. Moreover, that equal quantity is just a difference between the mean uh, growth rate regionally and the, mean, uh, the, uh, the regional environmental variance experienced by the population. And then for the patches not occupied by species I, you get a strict inequality that the regional difference is strictly greater than the local difference. So this often allows us to identify co-evolutionary stable strategies. And um, it has several interesting implications. The first is um, you might ask, is there something like an ideal free distribution characterization of this co-evolutionary stable strategy, i.e. do you just need that the average growth rates in the patches are all equal? The natural local growth rate in the patch is this uh, stochastic growth rate, which is given by the mean growth rate minus one half the variance. But in general, those are not equal across the patches um, under this CoSS condition. Moreover, this condition gives you a, an interesting dichotomy for each species. Each, spe each species is either occupying only one patch or it's occupying multiple patches. But if it's occupying multiple patches, it has a negative stochastic growth rate in each of those patches. So effectively, in the sense of stochastic, uh, stochastic growth rates, all the patches that are occupied are sinks if a species is occupying multiple patches. And I'll explain a little more about why that is the case when I talk about the economic analog of some of these results. Let me talk about some applications, uh, and these will be both for antagonistic interactions, so where at least one species is being harmed by the interaction. So first I'll talk about competing species and then predator-prey interactions. So for the competing species, I'll first focus on when I have two species, each of them has um, the same number of patches in which they're competitively superior. So there's an even number of orange patches where the orange warbler is superior and uh, an equal number of yellow patches where the yellow warbler species is superior. In this model, uh, the lockable terra parameters are just the intrinsic uh, per capita growth rate of each species in a patch. And then I'm assuming that the, there's the same amount of environmental fluctuations in each patch for both species and that everything is independent of one another, just for simplicity. And then the main assumption I make in addition is the symmetry assumption that in half of the patches, species one has the larger intrinsic rate of growth and that larger, it's larger by amount delta R and the other half of the patches species two has the higher intrinsic rate of growth by a factor of delta R. And then you can, um, and as I stated already, we're gonna assume the variances are all the same in the patches and they're spatially uncorrelated. So you get a basic inequality then, which says if the variance is sufficiently low, if the fluctuations in the patch are sufficiently low relative to the difference in the intrinsic rates of growth, um, then you get the ghost of competition passed. The um, co-evolutionary stable strategy has both species perfectly spatially segregated and there's no, they're no longer competing. However, if the variance exceeds this critical amount, delta R over K, then you get at least a partial exorcism of the ghost of competition passed. Species are partially occupying the patches in which they're competitively inferior, which might be viewed as sink patches for those species. 
So if I do illustrate this numerically for, I think this was 10 patches, then I'm plotting what fraction of individuals of each of the species is going into the patch in which they're competitively inferior. So those are sink habitats for the, uh, the species. And what we see is if the environmental variation is low, we have selection for the ghost of competition past. But as environmental variation increases, we have selection for uh, sort of to, um, exercising more and more of the ghost of competition past. We're ultimately under, well, eventually you might have close to half of the individuals in both types of patches, but they're always tending to be more in the patch and whether competitively superior. So this is a very sort of simple symmetric scenario and therefore it's easy to write down um, all uh, the solutions to identify the CoESS. But in general, that might not be so easy to do. So we devised a numerical approach that we have no proofs that this works, uh, but I'll explain at least why it might work. And so the approach is to use these invasion rates to define a replicator dynamic that can be viewed as a certain type of evolutionary process. And this is now just a system of ODEs, um, but quite nonlinear ODEs. Um, and what you can show uh, analytically quite easily is that if you have an internal equilibrium, then it satisfies the necessary conditions for the CoESS. But of course, that might not be sufficient. And also we don't know when those equilibria are stable and whether they're unique or not. But in all the simulations we've tried, it seems there is a unique equilibrium that's stable that you're converging to, and it seems to be the right uh, solution for the CoESS problem. So just to illustrate that numerical approach with a slightly more complicated scenario, I have here a situation where I think there are 20 patches where you're going along sort of an ele elevational gradient from low elevation to high elevation as you go from left to right, right. And then I'm plotting for three different species in this case, three different warbler species, their intrinsic rates of growth at these different elevations. So we have the blue species is more specialized at low elevations, the yellow species is more specialized at high elevations, and the green species is spe more specialized at mid elevations. And if we solve for the CoESS here numerically, in this case, we can actually solve for it analytically if I, when there's no environmental stochasticity, you get the ideal free distribution where they're perfectly spatially segregated into the patches where they're competitively superior and they're not occupying any of the patches where they have a negative intrinsic rate of growth. But now if you inject some uh, environmental stochasticity in this, this system, then you actually get the CoESS has them not exhibiting uh, a full ghost of competition past. There's partial overlap in their distributions. It's fairly complex, the pattern, as you go from low to high elevation. And interestingly, in places where the per capita growth rate on average is negative, you still see it being occupied by, in fact, all three species nearly at equal densities. So that's an example of applying these results to competing species. Uh, what about um, predator-prey interactions, the other important form of antagonistic interactions? So in this situation, I'm going to only have two patches, two habitat patches. One that I'm indicating in here yellow, which is a source patch, meaning that the per capita growth rate of the prey, this R1 term, is strictly positive. And the other, which I'm calling a sink patch, where what I mean by that is the per capita growth rate of the prey here is strictly negative. And then I'm assuming that, um, and then the predator is attacking both prey with the same attack rate in both patches. And then I'm assuming there's only environmental fluctuations in the source habitat, and it's only affecting the prey. And the variance of those environmental fluctuations is V. So it turns out in this case, you can analytically write down the necessary conditions for the CoESS. There's a unique one uh, identified by that. And I'm, show, I'm going to show you just numerically what these analytical conditions uh, imply. So uh, in this particular scenario, it turns out there's three critical levels of environmental variation on the source patch. Um, at low levels of environmental variation, so below this critical value V star that you can write down explicitly, you have selection for both species only using what I'm calling the source habitat source in the sense of a deterministic, deterministic source. Now, as you, if you increase the environmental fluctuations in the source, then you get selection for the prey species, an aphid here, to make use of what I'm calling the sink habitat. 
the white habitat. So that's in this region here. The yellow curve now is positive. Now, if you get to a higher level of environmental variation, V double star here, which you can write down analytically again, uh, you then get selection for both species making use of both habitats. So now you have a, a sink population of predator and prey. But then if you get to even a higher level of environmental variation, but not so high that it leads to the extinction of a prey, then you actually get selection for the prey to only make use of this deterministic sink habitat and the predator making, uh, sorry, the predator only making use of this deterministic sink habitat and the prey making use of both habitats still. So you get another situation where you have an enemy free habitat, but in this case, it's the deterministic source habitat. So in, in addition to these sort of interesting predictions about how you might have different sort of spatial configurations of the interacting species, depending, amount, depending on the amount of environmental fluctuations in the system, you can also get in, information about uh, their mean densities uh, under these different scenarios. So in this case, the mean density of the predator under the co-evolutionary stable strategy is always decreasing with increasing variation in the source. But you actually get situations where the prey density increases, even though you're injecting more stochasticity that you would think for a typical model would just lead to lower densities on average of the prey. So here we're getting sort of a uh, sort of an eco-evolutionary hydra effect that depends on the environmental stochasticity. In other words, as you're killing the prey through environmental stochasticity, they redistribute themselves in space in such a way that they actually have a higher mean density. So like their heads are doubling like the mythical hydra. Okay, so that's the other example that I wanted to talk about of antagonistic interactions. So now I'll get into relating the results to modern portfolio theory from economics and then wrap up with a conclusion slide. So modern portfolio theory um, was introduced in the 1950s by Nobel laureate Harry Markowitz. And apparently it's still a hip theory as of 2020, because it's still being used to design portfolios when you're making investments. Um, and the key, one of the key ideas from modern portfolio theory is if you have a bunch of investments, you can associate, you can think about what's the mean return of that investment and what's the risk of that investment, which I'm going to treat as one half the variance here. Usually they do the variance, but one half the variance is more convenient here and associate with each investment, which from the perspective of one of the species here is the different patches it could use. So each patch has a certain amount of risk, that's one half the variance, and each patch has a mean return, the mean per capita growth rate in that patch. And the key concept in the modern portfolio theory is to identify uh, weighted combinations of these investments, i.e. portfolios, that might give you a uh, a higher mean return for a given variance or a lower variance for a given mean return. And that leads to this efficient frontier. So the efficient frontier are realized, uh, are the sort of maximal, maximal mean returns that you can get from a portfolio given a certain amount of risk. Uh, so given a certain variance or equivalently, the uh, returns that minimize your risk given a, a desired uh, mean return. And so these are all weighted combinations of those investments, just like we're having species having fixed weighted combinations of how they're allocated across space. Now, a co-evolutionary stable strategy will always be tangent or sorry, on this efficient frontier, but you can ask where on this efficient frontier. Well, at a co-evolutionary stable strategy, the resident species are having on average a growth rate at the regional scale of zero that growth rate, the stochastic growth rate is determined by the mean minus one half the variance. So it has to lie at the coESS at stationarity on this white line where the mean equals one half the variance. So indeed the tangency between these two curves corresponds to the coESS for species I and each of these species will have a similar diagram. And what you can see from this diagram is that all the individual portfolio sorry, all the individual investments, i.e. the patches, are lying below this white line and therefore they have, as a consequence, negative stochastic growth rates. So the reason you're getting a higher growth rate in the portfolio, it's helping to reduce the effective variance experienced by the investment or by the species. So to conclude, 
I use the keep it, uh, keep it simple, Sebastian, because you're pretty stupid when it comes to um, thinking about the natural world, which meant I was assuming implicit space, uh, lock of Volterra type dynamics and Brownian motions for environmental noise. And I developed this framework with Alex, New uh, sorry, Alex Henning and Dan Nguyen uh, to extend prior work on single species uh, evolution of patch selection. And, and from that, we saw that we get a something like an ideal free distribution, but we have non-local quantities in, that are equalized across the occupied habitat. And that the non-local quantity is the covariance of the between the environmental fluctuations in a given patch and the mean uh, fluctuations experienced by the species across patches. And using sort of this characterization, I was able to look at how does temporal variation and antagonistic interactions select for sink populations, exercise the ghost of competition past, and sometimes select for these evolutionary hydra effects. And obviously this is the tip of the iceberg of things one could do to the extent one thinks this um, sort of framework is compelling. Um, and so there's many other scenarios where it would be interesting to see where these results can be applied. And with that, I thank you very much for listening, um, for all the organizers for putting together this delightful workshop and the National Science Foundation for funding my work. And I'd happily take any questions that we have time for. Yeah, we have uh, about 10 minutes time for questions. Uh, so thanks for your lovely talk. Um, I had a question about the predator prey slide. I was mm -hmm. kind of intrigued by this case where um, when you get towards the high source variance and then you end up with most of the predators being in the sink. And is there a, a, an intuitive explanation for why they end up? Yeah, I think the, the rough explanation is sort of uh, the um, flipped version of what happens at the intermediate uh, amount of variation where the predator is only using, quote, the deterministic source habitat. So uh, roughly, I think, uh, you know, it, that what's happening in when the environmental fluctuations are high in the source habitat, it's actually becoming also a sink habitat, meaning the stochastic growth rate is lower there. And it's effectively okay. a worse habitat than the sink habitat, what I was calling the sink habitat from a sort of stochastic growth rate uh, perspective of the prey. So here, um, pretty much what's likely happening, but I'd have to double check, uh, is that uh, things are persisting in each patch, even though within a patch they couldn't persist. So you also have like, really, if you shut down the source patch, things would collapse. If you sat down, shut down the sink patch, things would collapse. But because of sort of this reduction in variance experienced by the populations by hedging their bets across space, they're still able to persist. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thanks. Are there any other questions? I have a question, and since you like, you like us to keep it simple, uh, could you go back even further? So when you did not have three phase transitions, but just one, sure. could you just uh, give a little bit of uh, mathematical details here um, about the methods? Uh, well, the so in this case, it's just algebraic, right? So I don't know if you want me to, to like do the, the algebra, why not? <laughs> Right, because the previous criterion, the necessary condition uh, is algebraic, right? Because everything reduces to solving linear equations. Um, so, and so you just check for the necessary conditions. You find out there's a unique um, choice of the P's for both species that satisfy the necessary conditions. Um, we have not verified that they're sufficient. Um, so that, that's an open mathematical question. Is this really a coESS? Uh, but it seems to be at least like, um, so, uh, so that's all that we did in this case. It's just, it's just algebra. There's nothing interesting here in terms of the math, except that at least interesting biology, I would argue. Could you say again how the noise enters exactly in, in the algebra? I mean, what, what has Well, the noise enters like? in the algebra, I'll, I'll go a slide earlier. Uh, yes, it enters here uh, um, because these covariance terms are the noise, right? So these are the, these are the covariances, not of the, they're, de they're determined, of course, by the covariance matrices associated with the multivariate Brownian motions. But basically, th that covariance term is the covariance between patch I and the average fluctuations experienced by the population. So it's sort of determined by the covariance matrix multiplied by the patch allocation strategy. Um, and then you're still multiplying, you know. So anyways, that's, that's what these covariance terms are. So those are arising from the, from the Brownian motions.
Um, thanks. Uh, so and again, that this piece of math was trivial. I mean, it was just Lagrange multipliers. So there's not like as far as like um, after def, you know introducing that theorem about oh checking the invasion growth rate is enough. Everything just became simple multivariate calculus and algebra, meaning like high school algebra, not. <laughs> Not abstract algebra. Julian, is there a question in the chat? Question in the chat. Okay, so thank you again for a very nice talk with very beautiful slides. My pleasure. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Sure.